Over 400,000 burns present to the emergency departments in the United States every year, and many more present to their primary care providers' offices. This video reviews the steps for initial wound care of burns in an outpatient setting. First degree burns, typically a sunburn, no blisters, only require a moisturizer and pain relief. Second degree burns, also known as partial thickness, blisters are present and they need proper wound care and analgesia to facilitate healing and minimize functional and psychological complications. Burns over large surface areas, deep burns, and third degree burns are best managed by a referral to a burn center with specialty medical, surgical, nursing, and therapy care. Treatment of third degree burns is beyond the scope of this video. Initial wound care and debridement of dead skin and blisters are necessary to adequately assess the depth of injury and urgency of subsequent referral. Cleansing the wound is critical. In the following example, removal of soot and devitalized skin by simply wiping with a washcloth revealed a full thickness burn around the wrist, an indication for immediate referral to a burn center. Most, but not all, blisters require debridement. Generally, we recommend to leave alone or deflate the small non-bulging blisters under two centimeters and to completely unroof larger blisters. The provider must assess which patients will likely have a successful outpatient course. We use four criteria for that assessment. Burns can be very painful at all hours of the day and night, requiring scheduled medication for pain management. The patient will also need additional dosing for wound care should daily wound care be necessary. For many children, parents often need several sessions to acquire the skills and confidence necessary to perform wound care. Adults with burns may also benefit from a helper who can set up and apply ointments and dressings as necessary. Use of silver impregnated dressings for appropriate burns may simplify wound care. Non-English speaking patients and caretakers should verbalize and demonstrate good understanding of the wound care as well. We encourage burn patients to mobilize as much as possible to avoid disuse and extremity edema. In particular, lower extremity burns benefit from both elevation and walking, not from standing in place. Use of crutches or other assistive devices promote dependent disuse, edema, and pain, and such increases the risk of complications. Swollen hands or feet are high risk for infection. Providers must ensure that the patient has an environment to heal their injuries. The circumstances of burns are also important as any suspicion about neglect or abuse mandates a thorough workup rather than returning the victim to the same environment. Remember that not only children but also adults with physical or mental conditions are vulnerable to abuse. Reassuring the patient about upcoming wound care procedures and describing the steps in wound care will help alleviate anxiety. Using an age-appropriate scale to assess pain prior to, during, and after the procedure to ensure adequate pain control. The patient should pre-medicate with an oral narcotic medication approximately 20 to 30 minutes prior to the wound care. An oral benzodiazepine can also alleviate procedural anxiety and reduce problems with subsequent dressing changes, but may require post-procedure observation. For more severe pain and anxiety, it is appropriate to administer intravenous or oral forms of narcotic and anxiolytic medications. In some instances, a deeper level of sedation and increased monitoring may be necessary. However, the same level of analgesia and anxiolysis cannot be provided at home when additional daily wound care is expected. We advise hospitalization of the patient who requires anything more than oral analgesics until they are able to perform their own wound care with an oral pain regimen that can be replicated at home. Prepare the procedure room by ensuring that it is sufficiently warm. Lay out and prepare all necessary supplies prior to wound care to expedite the steps and decrease the duration the wound is exposed to the air. Wound cleansing at home requires hand hygiene, soap and water, and a washcloth, whereas medical and nursing providers must also wear gloves, mask, and sometimes a gown because of standard infection control practices. If the wound was previously dressed, use a generous amount of tap water to soak, remove, and discard old dressings. Gently wash the wound with wet, soapy washcloth and remove loose debris with forceps or clean scissors. Do not scrub the wound to cause bleeding. For heavy hair-bearing areas, such as the scalp, face, or forearm, 
Shaving the wound surface prevents accumulation of cream and ointment that becomes harder and harder to remove over time. Not shaving a bearded area will cause the hair to grow into the wound exudate and increase the risk of bacterial overgrowth. The patient might be tempted to simply add ointment rather than face the discomfort of shaving over the next few days. Do not shave eyebrows as they may not grow back. Once cleansed, the wound is ready for dressings. The application of dressings that contain a topical antibacterial agent that can be left in place for seven days avoids daily wound care and decreases discomfort. This child sustained a superficial second degree scald and was treated with a silver impregnated dressing. Once secured in place, it was only removed at clinic follow-up, at which point the burn was healed. Secure silver impregnated dressings with adhesive tape and a light wrapping of gauze. We recommend applying silver impregnated dressings only to superficial burns. Deeper second degree burns may progress to a third degree and eschar formation. Trapping devitalized tissue underneath an extended dressing may promote severe infection. Note that these dressings cannot be wet, so patients are advised to perform sponge baths until their follow-up visit. Prefabricated silver containing gloves and finger sleeves are commercially available, but issues with proper sizing, flexibility for hand motion, and costs are limiting their widespread use so far. So we recommend treating mobile areas such as hands, fingers, and feet with daily dressing changes. It's also difficult to keep extended dressings on the neck, face, and scalp for multiple days. We recommend daily dressing changes in those areas also. Superficial second degree burns should epithelialize quickly and are appropriate for bacitracin ointment. We recommend sulfur sulfadiazine for deeper second degree burns, at least initially, as some of these wounds may progress to full thickness over the next few days. For bacitracin, apply a thin ointment layer over xeriform gauze and then apply the xeriform to the patient's wound. For silver sulfadiazine, Use a tongue depressor or gloved hand to apply a thin layer to dry gauze, then apply to the patient's wound. Good secondary dressings to hold the gauze in place include dry curlex, cling, stretchy net, tuba grip, or isotoner gloves. Although daily wound care may seem inconvenient, the patient will be able to shower over those areas, wash hands, and change soiled dressings as necessary. Always dress the fingers individually. This promotes use of the hand and fingers. Do not mummy wrap the hand. Ask the patient to apply part of their dressings themselves and to perform range of motion exercise as a test of their readiness for outpatient care. Small blisters at the fingertips in a toddler who has touched a hot surface. Unroofing the blisters entails daily wound care for parents and caretakers for the next several days and unnecessary discomfort for the patient. Since hand dressings are difficult to keep in place in young children, we recommend either leaving the blisters alone or deflating them using a sterile needle. This avoids the burden of daily wound care. Instruct the patient to alternate elevation with use of the affected extremity as much as possible. Discharge the patient with instructional sheets for wound care, activities, range of motion exercises, and potential complications such as a wound infection. Schedule a follow-up appointment in five to seven days to reevaluate for wound healing. Insufficient supplies and pain medication may cause patients to avoid performing their wound care and to reduce their daily activities. Only a few patients with very small wounds do tolerate wound care without narcotics in the subsequent days. Do not prescribe prophylactic oral antibiotics. Initial wound care and debridement for second degree burns is a common procedure for emergency departments and primary care offices nationwide. With appropriate pain control and patient counseling, this procedure lays the foundation for successful outpatient management and healing.